This is North Carolina, ravaged by Hurricane Florence. On the ground, the distress is even clearer as people ponder what comes next. From the Carolinas to the Philippines, we are on the ground as people deal with the aftermath. And a special report from Puerto Rico reveals the terrible toll on mental health one year on. Tonight, after the disaster, we'll show you the long, difficult road back. We're also following political drama on both sides of the border. Why did a Liberal MP cross the floor to the Conservatives? And could decades-old allegations really sink a U.S. Supreme Court nominee? This is The National. Call it the unofficial launch of the election campaign. MPs are back for the last fall sitting before Canadians hit the polls. But one rookie MP dealt a surprise blow to Justin Trudeau, defecting from the Liberals to join the official opposition. David Cochran has more on the Conservatives' move designed to set a new tone for the year ahead. Undermine the government. She says her complaints were met COVID with silence, but everyone heard them today. After careful and deliberate consideration, I must withdraw from the government benches to take my seat among the ranks of my Conservative colleagues. On the first day of the fall sitting, Leona Alislev changed where she was sitting, crossing the floor to thunderous applause. I wish her uh, well in her decision. I'm looking forward to getting back in the House to talk about uh, uh, what we're going to be doing for Canadians, what we've been... The Prime on Minister on didn't say much, but Alice Lev says the Prime Minister is the problem, arguing he has failed in all the key areas. Tax reform, comprehensive foreign policy, defence and security. But there were no signs of those concerns in any of her social media posts, which often celebrated Trudeau, raising questions as to whether this was really about math. In 2015, Alice Lev won her seat over her conservative opponent by just over a thousand votes. But in this year's Ontario election, those same voters made a hard right turn and voted overwhelmingly to elect a progressive conservative. It's truly not about that. It's about being able to look my constituents and look myself in the mirror. Whatever the motivation, it gives Andrew Shear a bilingual female MP from a suburban Toronto riding he badly needs in order to win the next election. It also gives him a sales pitch. For all those Canadians who supported Justin Trudeau in 2015 and are dissatisfied or even angry about the leadership that he's been giving, the Conservative Party needs you. It's not clear if they can get more, but today the Conservatives got one they could gloat about. Oral questions. And made sure her new seat was in a prime spot on camera every time Shear spoke. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the Conservatives probably needed a win, and they certainly needed to reclaim the spotlight. That's why the timing of today's announcement was hardly a coincidence. For weeks, Shear has been overshadowed by the man who quit the Conservatives and declared the party morally corrupt. Today was Maxime Bernier's first chance to sit in his new seat with his new party name. Instead, Bernier was put firmly on the back bench and the back burner. The Prime Minister's summer of failure wasn't just about pipelines. It also included his lack of a plan to deal with the illegal border crosser crisis. Today was all about the official opposition and what they are arguing are the mistakes of the government. It is part of the story that Conservatives want to tell all this year leading up to the next election. The Prime Minister says it's not a sign of a bigger problem. It's a very sort of, okay, one team lost a member and it went to the other side. It can be an indicator of larger things. It can be just what it is. Uh, and we'll just stay focused on, on the things that we're focused on doing. But the Conservatives are hoping that for Canadians, and even, yes, for this one former Liberal, there is now another party to consider. And for today, that was win enough for them. Now to those powerful, deadly storms. Millions of people have had their lives turned upside down and are picking up the pieces. Tonight, we have their stories. In the Carolinas, thousands are still stranded by floodwaters, and those rivers keep rising. And in Puerto Rico, a year after a devastating hurricane, how people there are still struggling to cope. 
But let's start in Asia, where Typhoon Mangut has killed at least four people in China and many more in the Philippines. There, at least 65 people are confirmed dead, and then there are the missing. A horrific landslide came crashing down on one small mining community. And today, our Sasha Petrasek was there. High up in a mountain north of Manila, they dig, they scratch, they hammer, chipping away at what used to be a village. Before the mud came down, before more than 60 villagers disappeared. Now, hundreds of rescuers and volunteers battle exhaustion and risk new landslides to recover the bodies. The point here is we will continue. Typhoon Mangut may be gone, but it's left a big challenge for searchers and a growing list of the missing. We won't lose hope, no matter what, even if until they found the body. Lancy Belusay's two absent cousins are among them. She sits here next to dozens of other relatives, waiting and hoping. It's very hard to believe, but I still believe there are survivors still alive. Nearby, there is a shout, frantic shoveling, and another grim discovery. The people who are missing here were small-scale miners and their families, men who would literally spend their days panning for gold in this dirt, this mud, and in the water that came from these mountains. The irony is that, in the end, it was exactly the water that was flowing and the mud that turned out to be so dangerous. There's no uh, survivors anymore, as you can uh, uh, witness. So Jesus Yango is the local fire marshal. He says his men came to plead with the miners to leave before the storm. But they insist to be to stay here. So, so, so you asked them to leave, and they yeah, said, no, we want to stay. They, they said they wanted to protect their homes from the storm and looters, something Patrick Alcedo understands. He's also a miner living nearby. It is very hard to look for another uh, uh, place to stay. Even if it's dangerous here? Uh, yeah, because uh, that is life. On the day of the storm, clinging to that livelihood also brought death. And now it leaves Philippine communities with a hard job of recovery and a grim legacy. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, near Baguio in the Philippines. Of course, the difficult recovery process from Typhoon Mangut isn't confined to the Philippines. In Hong Kong, buildings all over the financial district are in dire need of repair. But the first priority, cleaning up all that debris and the fallen trees. So many roads were blocked. Thousands of extra commuters jammed public transit today. But in southern China, flooding is the most serious problem. And large areas still don't have power. Damage is expected to be in the billions of dollars. Mangut has been downgraded to a tropical storm, but it's still packing heavy rain and strong winds as it moves further inland. In the United States, similar stories of survival and struggle. Even though Florence moved into Virginia today, some people in North Carolina were warned the worst may still be not over for them. The danger is still immediate. That's because the rising river is expected to crest tomorrow and cause further flooding. This slow-moving storm dumped nearly one meter of rain in some areas. At least 31 people have been killed in the Carolinas and Virginia. One-year-old Caden Lee Welch was swept away by floodwaters last night after his mother lost her grip on him. He was my first and only child, and now he's just gone. There are the 400,000 people who still don't have power tonight and so many other struggles people are facing. And that's where the CBC's Paul Hunter picks up our story from Wilmington, North Carolina. Three days after Florence made landfall in this state and consider the lineup today at one of the few gas stations finally open in Wilmington, North Carolina. Those in line waiting up to three hours to tank up then something went wrong and the pumps were shut down again. I have been all the way to Leland, to Carolina Beach. I started out on Gordon Road this morning. I live in downtown Wilmington. No gas anywhere. 
Frustrations in this city hit hard by the storm are mounting as the challenges left behind by Florence grow. Workers are hard at it to bring back power needed for lights, refrigeration, air conditioning, all of it. But it's complicated. So many power lines are down, so many lives in distress. Surveying her property, or what's left of it, Jenny Hall has to wade through knee-deep water to get in or out. So we went to her. Basically, this is absolute devastation to me. How do you feel? Lost. I feel absolutely lost, and I have don't know where to start to put things back together. She told us she can't even easily call for help because her cell phone's dead, and there's no power to charge it. Meanwhile, outside Wilmington, the severe flooding continues, and so do the rescues. Today, helicopters took yet more people who couldn't escape on their own to safety. The storm has, by and large, passed by, but, said the governor today, This remains a significant disaster that affects much of our state. The next few days will be long ones as the flooding continues. Among those back at that gas station, some who fled their homes in the face of flooding and somehow made it to Wilmington. Willie Sloan told us now he doesn't have enough gas to get back. I wasn't going to stay in there last night with that water still rising. It was almost to my house. So I'm trying to get out there now to see what, how much damage was done. You need gas to get out to see whether you still have a house. Yeah, that's right. And then I try to find a way to get there. Not long after we spoke uh, with Willie Sloan, Ian, he gave up. And with what little gas he had left, he turned around and drove off. That's the way it is here these days. Long lines, long days, so much uncertainty. Paul, I would understand if people were angry and frustrated, but how are people handling it? Um, we've encountered remarkable positivity, uh, remarkable generosity. Uh, I'm not going to say tempers aren't flaring, and we saw some of that at the gas station today. Police told us there's been some looting, that kind of stuff happens. But by and large, positivity. Uh, we were walking down the street today, there were the fallen trees and down power lines and flooding, and a woman came up to us who had lost power in her house and whose fridge was no doubt full of food that had gone bad and her life was upside down, and she offered us bottled water because she thought we might need it. We didn't but she offered it. Um, the people we met yesterday who had been rescued from that village that was fully submerged, you know, water up to the rooftops, they had their life possessions in garbage bags. Nobody was freaking out. Nobody was screaming. Nobody was angry. They told us that they had what was most important, and that was each other. Um, Jenny Hall, who was the woman on the steps of her house that, in the piece that we just saw, who was despondent, right? Everything was terrible in her world. Uh, and after we chatted with her, I said, you must, you must feel helpless. And she said, yes, I do. Uh, helpless, but not hopeless, um, because I'll get through it, she said. And I, I think there's a lesson in that for all of us. It is all very impressive, as has been your reporting. Thank you very much, Paul. Florence is bringing back painful memories for people in Puerto Rico, devastated by Hurricane Maria nearly one year ago. But for many, it must feel like just yesterday, the island coming to grips with an emerging mental health crisis. When you hear these stories and you hear what people are going through, it, it, it weighs a toll on you. I, I just get, because it's hard. It's hard. We go in depth with a report from Puerto Rico that's coming up later on The National. In Washington, a vote on President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, has been put on hold, delayed by the allegation of a decades-old sexual assault that came to light for real on the weekend. A university professor says Kavanaugh assaulted her when they were teens. Now they will both testify at a public hearing next Monday. Keith Bogue now on what it means for Trump's nominee. She should not be insulted. She should not be ignored. She should testify under oath, and she should do it on Capitol Hill. But the first sign of how the day would unfold came when the president's counselor, Kellyanne Conway, said Brett Kavanaugh's accuser deserved a hearing. 
And Judge Kavanaugh should also testify as to these 36-year-old allegations. Next, Kavanaugh himself left home and headed to the White House, where he reportedly spent hours on the phone to various senators telling them his side of the story. Kavanaugh's accuser is Christine Ford. She says that when she was a high school student, maybe 15 years old, a drunken Kavanaugh, a couple of years older, attacked her in a bedroom at a party. She says he pinned her down on the bed, and she feared he might accidentally kill her. He had his hand over his, her mouth, and she was having a difficult time breathing. And he is larger, and he was pressing his weight against her. And so inebriated, he was ignoring the fact that she was attempting to scream and having a difficult time breathing. And uh, she believes that but for his inebriation and his inability to take her clothes off, he would have raped her. Kavanaugh at first said it never happened, then today said he wasn't even at the party Ford described. But key Republicans believe the allegations need investigation. Obviously, if Judge Kavanaugh has lied about what happened, that would be disqualifying. It was no surprise when the president put the confirmation vote on Kavanaugh's nomination, scheduled for Thursday, in doubt. If it takes a little delay, it'll take a little delay. Then he suggested Democrats have been sitting on the story, waiting until the last minute to disrupt Kavanaugh's confirmation. I wish the Democrats could have done this a lot sooner, because they had this information for many months, and they shouldn't have waited till literally the last days. They should have done it a lot sooner. Senate Republicans are making a point of that, too. It is an accusation which the ranking member of the Committee of Jurisdiction has known about for at least six weeks. Known about for six weeks. Yet chose to keep secret until the 11th hour. Keith joins me now from the U.S. Capitol. How much truth, Keith, is there to this accusation that the Democrats have actually been sitting on this story for weeks in an attempt to actually derail the nomination like this? Well, it's true that Senator Dianne Feinstein has known about this since July the 30th. But Christine Ford's attorney says it was always up to her client to decide whether she wanted to go public, and at first she didn't. When the story leaked last week, though, she decided it might as well come out in her own voice. And how much trouble is Kavanaugh's nomination in now? Do you have a sense of that? Well, this is serious. Kavanaugh has now said he wasn't even at the party where the alleged assault took place. And that's something that might turn out to be easily disproved. Plus, when they testify Monday, it's going to be a spectacle. And it'll be up to Republicans to challenge the woman's credibility, and that sometimes turned out to be not a very good look for them. And it's especially risky when elections will be just six weeks away. All right. Keith Bogan, Washington Tonight. Thank you. And let's take you through some of the other stories we are tracking live tonight on The National. Starting down south with a move by the Trump administration to slash the number of refugees allowed into the country. The new cap, 30,000 refugees for the entire 2019 federal fiscal year, which starts in the U.S. next month. That's a sharp drop from 2016 when Barack Obama set a cap of 110,000 refugees. The child was conscious, taken to hospital, and examined and reunited with her family. And relief in Saskatchewan tonight after a six-year-old girl was found safe. Her disappearance sparked an amber alert, but she was found this morning alone in her family's SUV. It was stolen last night at a strip mall just a few kilometers away with the child still in the back seat. But now, as you heard, she's back with her family and her mom says she's sleeping soundly. Police, meanwhile, are looking for a suspect. Still ahead on the national, our Joanna Emiliotis checks in on the people of Puerto Rico one year after Hurricane Maria left them devastated. Plus, we've talked a lot about whether this country is ready for pot to go legal a month from now, but tonight we ask the question, are businesses the ones rolling the dice? And immigration continues to be the hot issue leading into the final weeks of the Quebec election. They can't just walk in at the border and we accept them like that. They have to go through like what we all did, like all the other immigrants did. With just two weeks to go now before Quebec's provincial election, voters saw something new tonight, the first ever televised debate in English. Immigration took center stage. 
Liberal leader Philippe Couillard and François Legault, the leader of Coalition Avenir Québec, sparred repeatedly. The Coalition, which is ahead in the polls, advocates reducing immigration numbers in the province and having newcomers take a Quebec values test. It's distressful to hear you speak about immigration the way you do it. Submitting people to testing, which is not needed. Threatening them, threatening them and their families with expulsion. That's right. Threatening men, threatening them of, with expulsion. Incredible. And if they don't, what is incredible? You, you never you said say, that. What you, you, say, you said it's that. unacceptable. Oh, yeah? It's your you program, sir. You cannot discuss in a calm that. way no. about better integration. I'm going to say, you had a failure. I'm going to say, to go very calmly, very yeah. calmly to do that your policy is not acceptable. Yeah. And submitting right. immigrants to testing and expulsion you had a is the opposite of what you we had can a do. Failure. What we say is that we better receive 40,000, have a better integration, don't lose 26%. And the only thing we say, like we have in many European countries, have a test of French and a test of values in the first three years. It's reasonable. It's done in other countries. They so why don't expel is them. Mr. Lise and Mr. Cuyard saying that okay. it's scandalous? We're almost, we're out of, we oh. have that in Europe. The CBC's Jayla Bernstein now with more on the immigration issue, the rhetoric, and how voters seem to be responding. It's arguably the most divisive proposal of the election campaign in Quebec, a French language and values test for all newcomers who want to stay in the province. Francois Legault says flunk and face removal. They have three years and we'll give them free lessons to learn French. Wading into immigration policy can be polarizing. The party leader is in hot water for saying people can become citizens within a few months, when in fact it takes at least three years. So he wants to do expulsion tests. He fails the understanding tests. Liberal leader Philippe Couillard says immigrants aren't a problem. He says they're the answer to the province's labor shortage. Voters, like politicians, are divided. When it comes to immigration, opinions can swing. Lena Bino immigrated to Quebec as a child. They can't just walk in at the border and we accept them like that. They have to go through like what we all did, like all the other immigrants did. Maria De Giorgio also moved to Quebec from Italy. She calls Legault's policies close-minded. When we came, we were welcome. The, the only condition was that uh, you made a living for yourself and, uh, you know, slowly found a job. But it takes time. Meanwhile, those who work closely with newcomers are trying to dismiss the myth that immigrants get an easy ride. The process is long and laborious and costly, uh, even with all the good things. If, even if every, you know, a family has all the points like, on their side, it's going to be difficult. Monique Lapointe so, says most immigrants do make an effort to learn French. Uh, the newcomers themselves, I would say the great majority, are very interested and engaged in speaking French. It's a matter of earning a proper living. She's afraid politicians get caught up in the rhetoric and forget too easily the reality of what it is to move to a new country and start a new life. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Still ahead on The National, betting billions on an industry that doesn't have any customers yet. We'll look at the stakes and the strategies of Canada's biggest players in the new legal pot market. But first, meet the host of CBC Kids News, a mainly online platform aimed at ages 9 to 13. In preparation for CBC Kids News, we've been filming different segments, different uh, little stories that we were hoping to put out on the website. The whole appeal is that it's a broad spectrum of different things to choose from, and it's news for kids from kids. Nearly a year ago, Hurricane Maria tore into Puerto Rico. The Category 4 storm packed winds of 250 kilometers an hour. It devastated the island, leaving much of its infrastructure in ruins and most of its 3 million residents without power for months. So as the one-year anniversary approaches, many Puerto Ricans are feeling not only devastated but abandoned. And as the CBC's Ioana Remiliotis explains, the island is a place where daily survival has become a state of mind. Yeah. 
They burst into the morning, caricatures of an island in crisis. We're here to, to bring them a little hope. Um, we give them a little happiness, a little, a little joy. A year after Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, a quiet emergency is still unraveling. This health fair, complete with Disney characters, is all about breaking the silence that comes with it. We're at the peak of the hurricane season. So if you hear anything about any kind of a storm, you, it gives you like a flashback. Our job is to let them know that they're not alone. There is a natural inclination to measure progress in power. But while electricity has been restored for the most part, it remains fragile. And an enduring trauma lies in the emptiness in what was. On the eastern coast, an area raised by the eye of the hurricane, what is still missing so many months later is the gift of normalcy. Come on. So this is, a, this is your home? You have no roof. Watch your step there. Where's everything? That what I got, I did, I did that myself. Because I was getting the kitchen a lot of water. In Aguabo, wow. we meet Angel Luis Sandoyal Mendoza, a man whose story hasn't changed. If everything blew off with Maria? Everything blew off. So this is so your kitchen? I, yeah, that way I cook. Oh my goodness. What's it like living like this? <laughs> it's bad, but I mean, what can I do? It's been a year of living alone in what's left of his home. You want to go inside? Yes. He rarely sleeps, afraid of burglars. What does it do to your state of mind, like to how you're feeling? <clears throat> I don't know. I try not. I try not to think about it. You're trying to forget. Angel is one of the hundreds in this area alone, still waiting for government aid from FEMA, the U.S. agency in charge of the recovery effort. FEMA won't provide money without the deed to the house, but the home has belonged to his family for generations. There's no way for him to get it. I've been able to reevaluate a lot of things, and, and this morning we contacted FEMA to see if they can reevaluate. Yeah. Jerry Kirkland is in charge of emergency services in Aguabo. He's trying to help Angel navigate what often feels like an inhumane bureaucracy. Any hour, any time of day, you can give me a call and I'll be right here. Okay? Yeah, I appreciate it, yeah. Thank you. Don't worry, you're not alone. We'll be here. Yeah, all right. It doesn't make sense, you know. At this type of time, after almost a year, we still have people living in these conditions, you know, and it, it's not easy for us as emergency managers, as a municipality agency, because we don't have the funding that we can say we can come and fix it, because we don't. It's frustrating to see our people suffer at this time, at this stage. Yeah. We're going to be going here. Jerry can only do so much. So where are we heading? Okay, we're going to um, a barrio called Kubuy. It's barrio His municipal budget it's was drained soon after it's Maria hit. It's a section of Rio Blanco. Ese va bien. Está bien. No se preocupe que tú conoces a Axel. Yo voy a estar coordinando con Axel para que Axel. Now he offers what he can. Mostly, it's reassurances, especially at this time of the year. Correla, okay. Okay, okay. People are starting just back to get back to normal, you know, and they're just getting back on their feet. So if, if another hurricane comes, what's going to happen? And, and how are we going to deal with it? Right now, my concerns are the mental health of the people. How are they going to take it? You know, we drive higher and higher into the mountains. I'm going to show you uh, the road that was very badly damaged and stop where a landslide dropped massive boulders. Where there was no way that they could pass by. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no... This road was blocked for three months. Help couldn't get through. This whole landslide, they were bigger than that. Those boulders were bigger than that. That's still a problem. One of our concerns when the boulders came down was that house. This because, one right here? Yeah, You're going to knock on no, that door? Uh, we could. I don't know if anybody's there, but... 
¿Cómo estás? Yeah, I speak, I speak English. We just stopping by just to let you guys know we put another plan in, in place. We learned a lot from Marie. Um, and one of our, my main concerns was the, the landslide that there. I had. Yeah, it's, we know that there's still boulders. So yeah. we just wanted to come by to make to assure you guys that we're going to be here. Okay. Rex Caldwell and his wife moved to Puerto Rico 15 years ago. They sought refuge in their bathroom when Hurricane Maria hit. I got my back against the door to keep it shut, and it keeps blowing it open. I press it back again, all right? The water that's in the toilet, all right, there was high pressure under the house. It was pushing the water in the toilet up like a fountain. Uh, what toll did it take on you? None. How long before you got your electricity back? Oh, nine months. Nine months, right? So we were How do you feel about that? Well, you don't feel anything. You just survive. Alrighty. All right. Thank you. See you guys. So what did you make okay. of that visit? Well, well like when he started to, to describe how he passed the hurricane night, you see how he was in the, in the bathroom holding against the, the wall. Um, but then he says, no, everything's fine. You know, it, that's what we're worried about. So it you takes didn't us. buy it that he was Oh, worried. no, of course not. That pride makes it hard to grasp the extent of the need. But there are alarming clues. This is part of the, the old hospital that we, we um, renovated. Dr. Renovate. John Velasquez is the medical director of the only hospital in Naguabo. For weeks after the hurricane, it was the only one open in the entire eastern region. It became a beacon for another cry for help that continues. We decided to build a, a new unit for that kind of people that came without physical condition, only mental condition. What kind of mental conditions? Um, depression, suicide. The need was catastrophic then, he says, and still is now. People still come here every day. They feel like they don't want to live more because they don't have nothing right now. And they feel sad because the house is going down. They can't um, build, again? build again. They say, doctor, I don't want to live it like this. A mental health emergency was looming before blue tarps became metaphors of Hurricane Maria. Puerto Rico has been in a recession for a decade. Jobs are scarce and migration continues to tear families apart. What the hurricane robbed, too, was the simple reassurance of routine, of knowing what tomorrow may bring, including power. Blackouts still happen all the time. In the next town over, in Yabacoa, a U.S. military medical mission winds down. It also offered mental health support. We know that many more people will come out with some symptoms and other um, conditions, mental health conditions. Saludo, buenos dias. A psychiatrist by training and a native Puerto Rican, Colonel Victor Torano believes the worst is yet to come because many are still processing the trauma. Look, look at this. Um, this is, uh, These anonymous questionnaires, he says, reveal a lot. Lost my job, lost my home, uh, lost uh, my car, clothing. Do you have any emotional conditions? No. I feel like I want to disappear. Wow. Um, but I have been able to maintain control. So again, you know. Wanting to disappear, that's pretty severe. Absolutely. You know, in their minds, they normalize how they feel. They think, you know, that since everyone's feeling the same as they are, they do not need to seek help. It's not easy. I cry at night. I cry in the bathroom. I hardly cry in front of anybody because I have to be strong. You see that black spot there? Water comes down, it filters down through there. Rain poured into Taina Fernandez's house after Hurricane Maria. She lost her job and money is tight, so the roof still leaks. 
her mom suffers anxiety attacks and her children still cry at the sound of rain. Home is hard, so is helping others. I wanted to become something useful and beneficiary to the community. Taina is fighting to get an old school turned into a community center to help people still suffering, including those who couldn't get their loved ones to hospitals or even to a morgue. People were buried in their backyards. An old lady buried her husband in the back of her home because there was no way to get out of her home. And he had died, he had been dead for three days and she had to bury him in the back of her, of her home. When you hear these stories and you hear what people are going through, it, it, it weighs a toll on you. I, I just get, because it's hard, it's hard. You try to help people, but you are going through no job. You have so many things on top of you, but you still want to help. Who's helping you? Who's helping me? My family, who's, who holds me up? We don't have everything we need, but at least we have what we need right now in the moment. Next week, I'll worry about next week, next week. Tests of faith, they're everywhere you look. Not far away, a youth group gathers outside. Hurricane Maria destroyed their church. There's no money to fix it. And so they sing, under a night sky. And Joanna joins us now in our studio. People there clearly suffering, and there is kind of a grim measure of how deep that suffering is. Absolutely, and the big indicator is a place called Linea Pass, which is the main suicide hotline that services the entire island of Puerto Rico. Shortly after Hurricane Maria, they were receiving 800 calls a day, and the suicide rate spiked by 30% for that time of year compared to the year before. Today, they're still receiving 600 calls a day, and the suicide rate is at 20% higher than it was the year before. And the majority of those calls are prompted by people who are still having a lot of trouble rebuilding, reconstructing their lives, because many people have lost their jobs, and they just simply can't get back on their feet. And that's prompted an extraordinary outreach program, because we heard about that Puerto Rican pride in our piece about people feeling too proud to ask for help so because of that and they don't want to see a repeat of last year and anniversary tends to be a huge trigger they're going out and doing outreach they're literally the goal is to go door to door at every house in Puerto Rico to check in on people see how they're doing and the thinking is maybe at home they're more likely to feel comfortable and admit that they could use some help let's talk about the death toll for a moment obviously there's been a lot of debate in the United States about that number how has it been playing particularly the revised death toll in Puerto Rico that number that's recently come out is a number that everybody suspected. And that was the case last year when we were there, and this year even more so since now there's these two independent studies that put that death toll um, uh, to 3,000 and even higher in some cases. And the issue has always been that the death toll that the Puerto Rican government has put out is very directly related to that day, i.e. a truck um, you know, went off the road and somebody died. But the bigger issue, and the one that's a really heated one, especially with Trump's comments, is about the fact that the recovery rate was slow. And that was why people couldn't get to hospital to get to dialysis treatment, for example, or roads were washed out for weeks. And that's at the core of the issue now and remains a very heated debate. Okay. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. There are signs of recovery in Puerto Rico, especially in the capital of San Juan. Major hotels have reopened. Tourists are trickling back. And in one corner of the city, our crew caught this scene of resilience. Everyone. Well, tonight on The National, meet the man who's paying SpaceX to take him on a trip around the moon. That's Japanese e-commerce entrepreneur and billionaire Yusaku Mezawa. And in a twist, it's not just him embarking on this first ever private voyage to the moon. Mezawa says he plans to invite six to eight artists to join him. 
when the trip happens, still unclear though, as the big Falcon rocket they'll be riding on still needs to be built. Both parties are looking forward to putting this matter behind them and there'll be no further media comments. And a resolution today to a bitter family feud over a lottery win in Nova Scotia. Barbara Reddick will share some of her $1.2 million Chase the Ace jackpot winnings with her nephew, but the prize won't be split in half. It originally was because her nephew's name was written on the winning ticket. Reddick sued him, though, saying she only had him write his name for good luck and that she never actually agreed to split the winnings. The settlement in the end, though, he gets about a quarter of the money, 350000 bucks. Could the next flavor of Coke be cannabis? Today we learned Coca-Cola has been in talks with Canadian pot company Aurora Cannabis about creating a drink infused with a cannabis extract. It wouldn't get you stoned, there's no psychoactive component, but some say it helps reduce inflammation and joint pain. And they're not alone. Just last month, another one of Canada's big three licensed producers, Canopy Growth, announced a multi-billion dollar tie-up with the owner of Corona Beer. Without question, this is an industry looking to scale up with lots of companies out there wondering how they'll cash in. But keep in mind, there aren't actually any customers yet, right? Legalization is still a month away, meaning all these companies can only guess how big an industry this will really end up being. So let's bring in our senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. And Peter, I get why companies want to get ahead of the ball, but, but this early in the game, aren't they taking on a lot of risk? They sure are. And I mean, this whole thing has been based on a promise. They haven't had to deliver anything yet. So we went down to Leamington, Ontario to see Afria, one of the biggest cannabis companies in the world. And they're right now, they're packaging, they're shipping the pot that they've already sold to the various provinces. So the test is upon them. Can they ship on time? Will the system survive increase in demand? Will that expect or the, the expectation of demand actually emerge the way we've sought it? Uh, I asked that exact question about risk to Afria's CEO, Vic Neufeld. There will be failures. There will be shortcomings. There will be short shipments. It's the, it's the ability of licensed producers who have these brands that they've, they've thrown out there in many press releases and promises here, there, and everywhere. What is truly the reality going to be? Uh, who is prepared? I'm going to suggest to you no LP is fully prepared. Wow, okay, that, that, that's quite an admission. So, so what's the master plan then to make sure that they don't get in over their heads? Well, it's interesting because they all have different master plans. Some, as you mentioned off the top, are looking for partnerships, and some of that, sure, is a nod to the future and the potential for the edibles and the THC-infused products. But some of it, Andrew, is just finding a big company like, say, Coca-Cola that has a $195 billion market cap, and that can give you some cushion. If, you know, deliveries go wrong, if shipments don't quite work out, a partnership like that can give you some breathing room. Right, but not all companies have gone that route, right? Uh, Fria, which is one of those big three producers, I haven't seen them announce partnerships with anyone. No, uh, at least not yet, and I keep your eye on that. But in a lot of ways, what they say is their size is their cushion, and they're adding capacity in droves. I interviewed Neufeld in that enormous, I think it's 250,000 square foot greenhouse. But look at this. This is the greenhouse that's coming online in May or June. This one's 750,000 square feet. They've got a bunch of others as well. And Neufeld says it's their size that really sets them apart. That's three million square feet of footprint. That will be capable on an annualized basis in excess of 255,000 kilos of harvest. A year. A year. I'm going to suggest to you that by May or June of 2019, we will be in what we call full crop rotation. That means every greenhouse square foot I've just described will have plant at certain life cycles to it. Uh, we'll be kicking out in excess of 20,000 keys a month. A month. A month. 20,000 kilograms. So, so what he's saying is they're all in. They're definitely all in, and they're just going to try to bring that cost down. Now we get to see, will it actually work? Peter Armstrong, good to talk to you. You bet. Our moment of the day is up next. Stay with us. When you think of strong, pioneering Canadian women, you might think of writers who've expanded our minds, diplomats who've raised our international stature, great legal and political minds who've made life more just. What doesn't come to mind, well, for most of us anyway, is the idea of taking those achievements and slapping them onto women's lingerie.
Which is why La Maison Simons, one of Canada's oldest retailers, is now offering an apology. And that's tonight's moment. Legendary Franco-Manitoban author Gabrielle Roy, one of Canada's most influential writers, and until today, she inspired this little number. First female former Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, has a nimble legal mind, and apparently she makes a nimble bralette. There's a whole series of these. Nellie McClung, Flora McDonald, and more. Simons announced the campaign earlier this month, thinking people would appreciate their efforts to honor the women this way. And let's just say it went over like a lead balloon. Simons has since apologized to McLaughlin, the only living inspiration in the series, and says it will help raise money for women's shelters. And, you know, in the first line of that apology, uh, you know, the company did try to briefly explain what they were trying to do, you know, acknowledge the, the historical significance of these pioneering and inspirational women. But I do have a hard time imagining how they could have arrived at that point without realizing how badly all of this might have turned out, that maybe it would be interpreted as reducing their accomplishments to a piece of lingerie. I, I don't fully understand it myself. Both of you have lived in Quebec. Uh, both of you know the Simons chain, although they are national now too, uh, family run for many years. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how the apology plays, because I thought it, they, they handled that part well. And they just said, you know what, we made a mistake. They, we're destroying all materials and we're meeting Rosie to see how we made this mistake. And as the only one here who has a bra, I can say it's not normal that they have names. And with that, I'll leave, I'll let you guys off know. the hook. I got nothing. <laughs> That's the National for September 17th. Good night, fellas. Good night. <laughs>